Today, we are looking at Ephesians chapter 1. And we will be starting in verse 3 and go through till verse 14. <clears throat> Last week we touched on um, sort of the, the, the difference of seeing ourselves either as a sinner or as a saint or whatever way you want to parcel that out. And we talked about a little bit anyway what it means to, to sin and how we travel with that and how to encourage us to move forward um, in life. And so we're going to continue on that train a little bit this morning as we look at these verses. We're going to look at what it means to be part of something bigger than ourselves and how that ties in with this concept of sin that we'll be looking at. Because there is something bigger going on around us. And it's easy to forget about it, or perhaps ignore it, or perhaps let it kind of slip by. And of course, this bigger thing that we're talking about is the kingdom of heaven. The plans of God for each one of us individually, but also the world as a whole. And this isn't just something that God happens to do or maybe has done or maybe will do, but it's something that he continues to do through us. Something that we can be actively involved in as we go forward. And that's through how we interact with the world around us, but also how we behave ourselves and how we think about ourselves in the world. So we can be part of this uprising or part of this revolution, probably is a better word for it. Something that is changing the world each and every day as we move forward and as we seek to make the world a better place. <clears throat> um, there's things happening. But there's two ways to talk about something that happens, isn't there? When something happens, we can tell a story and say such and such happened as a fact. Or we can say, I did something or we did something, or I helped with something, or I made something, or I was a part of something. And even though it might be the same thing that happened, if we're a part of it and we remember that peace, it makes a greater impact. It makes us feel like we did something, and it's not just, oh, I heard about this something that happened over there, and I guess it happened, and we move on. But if we did something, we want to share that with the world. And that's part of what we're doing today is looking at how we're not only small or unimportant or as uninteresting as we perhaps feel sometimes. But we are in fact part of something bigger. So Ephesians 1, 3, <clears throat> we're going to kind of just go through it a couple verses at a time and then unpack it a little bit. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. So he has this plan for us in particular. He chose us. He set us apart to be blameless. And if that is the state, if that is the sort of where we're at, then the question inevitably comes up, why are we, why do we sin? Why do we not act in a blameless way if God has, before the foundations of the world, chosen us to be blameless? Well, there's two ways to look at this. These are the two ways that we kind of touched on a bit last week. The ways of looking at yourself as a sinner or looking at yourself as a saint. There's two sort of camps people fall into. Let's say we are blameless. As it says in verse 3 here, uh, we, uh, in Christ we have every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. There's nothing held back from us. And before the foundations of the world, this is where we're at. So we are blameless. 
And the reason why we sin is sometimes we just act outside of our own character. Sometimes we're not acting as we are. So we've arrived spiritually, but we're not yet manifesting that perfectly in the way we do things, in the way we act, in the way we talk. That's one way of looking at it. That would be what's called being a saint, the way of looking at it. And the other way to look at it is that we're not blameless, uh, and we try to act as good as we possibly can. And we haven't arrived yet, but we have hope that one day we will, and our hope is, is rooted in Christ. And that is the, the, the other way of looking at it. But I think they both get us to that same space. They both have this nugget in there of saying, there is something that we can do. There is, yes, God's plan and God's will and God's direction. And then there is also the way that we can get involved in this and the way that we can flourish and the way that we can continue forward. And ultimately, God's desire is for our good. His plans are bigger than what we currently see. Neither of these ways of looking at it says that we are kept outside of God's plans or outside of God's actions until we miraculously become blameless, and then we can enter into God's plans and be used by him. But instead, he chose us right where we are. Before the foundations of the earth, he knew everything we were going to do, he knew everything we have done, he knows everything we will do, and he chose that person to be part of this story, part of his story. Continues on, talks about how this choosing sort of plays and how he could choose us knowing everything about us. It says, He destined us for adoption <clears throat> as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasures of his will and the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Grace accepts us into his story. He's chosen us to be blameless, and yet sometimes we don't necessarily act in that way. But he says that it will not keep you from being part of what I'm doing. That will not keep you from being part of this journey, part of this plan, part of this story. And so I need to put something in there that will help along this journey. And that's what we call grace. That even though you don't act in a blameless way, I see you in that way because of my grace. Because I want to journey with you. I want to do life with you. That is, in fact, the reason why he created us. God was not, he was not required to create us. He chose to create us because he wanted us. But there is this nasty thing called sin that we have to talk about, isn't there? This thing that gets in the way. It gets in the way of his plan for us in particular, but also his plan for the world around us. Sin is that thing that can make us feel small or useless or unworthy or unimportant. It is designed to debilitate us, designed to make us feel like we are less than we actually are. Think about it for a minute. If God has this great plan for us, then the best tool that Satan could use is something that tries to keep us out of that plan. If sin keeps us out of the game, the kingdom work is not being done. And so Satan slows God's plan by convincing us that God could not possibly use us as part of those plans because of our sin. But the truth is that we've been chosen, chosen to be blameless. And we hear things all the time like, oh, I'm a sinner, or, you know, everyone sins, or something to that realm. And this is potentially sometimes a useful way of talking, depending on the context, but a lot of times I think we say these things to sort of convince ourselves 
or to convince someone else to say, oh, it's okay. Everyone sins. Everyone messes up. It's okay. It's just part of life. And though that might be true, it doesn't make that a good excuse for poor behavior. It needs to be something that we are aware of, something that is a roadblock, something that is blocking us from being better than we could be, so that we can be aware of it and say, just because that's a tendency, just because that's a deception that's here, doesn't mean I have to buy into it. <clears throat> and the reason why we don't have to buy into it continues on in the verse. Verse 7, it says, we have redemption. Redemption through his blood. Forgiveness of our trespasses. According to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. So we have been forgiven. There's this nasty thing in there called sin, and yet that thing has been forgiven. It's not just that thing that we happened to do yesterday that's been forgiven, but it's all sin all the time. Because sin, even though the way we think of it often, is not actually the action that we are doing. Sin is not the, the essence of the thing we're doing that we call the sin. Sin is deeper than that. It's the state that we live in. It's the state of being unaware of our, uh, of, sorry, unaware of God's purposes for us, or purposely ignoring those plans for our life. Going away alternate to God's way. And this, of course, manifests in all sorts of ways, and we can list them off simply by saying the Ten Commandments, or by saying many other things that we can say. These are all the actions or the things that we see that are the manifestations of what's going on in our hearts or in our minds. These are the things that we do that are outside of God's plan, outside of God's will. But I think it's more important than just taking those things and saying if we stop doing those things, then we can be more blameless and we can be better used in God's plan. I think it's deeper than that. It's about changing our minds, changing our hearts, changing our attitudes. I was going for a walk yesterday with the kids. And I've got a two-seat stroller, so Derek goes in one seat, and usually the other seat is for either Ryland or Elam, and they share who sits, and then the other person gets out, and they walk, and they sit, and Elam decided he wanted to walk the whole time. He was having a great time. But there's only one problem with that. <clears throat> he gets very distracted. And he can see something across the road, and all of a sudden he's going across the road, and he can see this thing over here, and, and he could be looking at nothing in particular, just staring off into space, and all of a sudden he's not beside me, but he's in, walking in the middle of the road, and all sorts of crazy stuff. So I keep having to sort of get his attention, remind him, you got to walk beside me, you got to stay over here, and don't walk in the middle of the road. And he doesn't understand why, right? But let's say this behavior of walking in the middle of the road is the thing that I'm addressing, right? It is, quote unquote, the sin that I'm addressing. But it's not the behavior I want to fix. What I want to instill in him is that walking in the middle of the road is dangerous. I want to instill in him that there is a way, this thing that we're doing is dangerous for you. So we want to try and stay out of danger as much as we possibly can. That is the root behind the action. He doesn't understand that it's dangerous. And so again, there's two ways. When he becomes a teenager and he purposely walks in the middle of the road, he understands that it's dangerous, but he's doing it just to spite me, right? <clears throat> that, that day may come, I don't know. But that's sort of an analogy or ways in which we can frame this thing we call sin. It's not about the action, it's about why we are doing the action. And again, there's two reasons. We can be totally unaware that it's dangerous for us. We can be totally unaware that this thing we are doing is against God's best plan for our life. And so we need some knowledge in that respect. Or we can know that it's bad for us and do it anyway. Again, it's all about doing something that is against the best way that God has for us. So we either lack the knowledge or wisdom, or we have the knowledge and wisdom, 
we do it anyway. In verse 8, it continues on, and it talks about sort of this first way of thinking about this. Uh, It says, With all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, and he set forth in Christ. So he has now made known to us his will. We have access to knowing what he plans for us, what he plans for the world, how we can be engaged in this thing. It's been made known. We're not no longer like the two-year-old walking in the middle of the road, not aware that it's dangerous. We've been made aware that it's dangerous. And so now if we're not doing it that way, we are intentionally going against his will. And I think that part comes in with our concept of God. See, if, if Elam trusts me <clears throat> as the parent to know that everything I'm telling him is for his benefit and for his good, then whether he understands it or not, he's going to walk beside me instead of in the middle of the road. However, if he grows up and someday decides, you know what, Dad, I know a better way. I think that your way for me really isn't aiding me, really isn't helping me. Your plan for my life is no good. I've got a better plan, and that includes walking in the middle of the road, even though you say it's dangerous for me. And that's the other side of it, right? The side where we have acquired the knowledge, where we know what we shouldn't be doing, and we're doing it anyway because we think, my plans are better. I'm more important. And that's the hard attitude of every, shall we say, action that we call a sin, isn't it? If we're committing adultery, we're saying, I am more important than the people around me I should be loving. If we're stealing things, we're saying, what I need right now is more, far more important than what this person already has. All these things can be put in the same bracket, the same space of selfishness, of doing something for my own will and my own plan and my own desire instead of doing something for bringing God's kingdom to the earth, making the whole place around me better. The verse goes on. It says, uh, or read verse 9 again because it kind of continues on. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to the good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things to him, things in heaven, things on earth. And in Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praises of his glory. So there's the plan. To gather up all things, things on earth, things in heaven, to himself. There is nothing outside of his plan. He wants everything and everyone to be part of this thing. And that includes us. It says it is our inheritance to be part of this very thing that maybe sometimes we aren't aware of or maybe sometimes we intentionally reject because we feel like we want to be part of something different. And what does it mean to have an inheritance? An inheritance is something that is given to someone after someone has died, isn't it? For instance, when the, uh, the prodigal son, when he goes to his father and asks for his portion of the inheritance, he basically saying to his father, I wish you were dead, right? Because I want what's allotted to me now instead of what you are going to give me after you die. It's that pattern we're looking at here, that pattern of desiring for me before I desire for the world. So this is the inheritance. So the question is, who has died in order to give us that inheritance? And of course, the answer is Jesus, right? Jesus, in his death, left behind an inheritance. And that inheritance is, as we call the Great Commission. The mission that Jesus was on while he was on the earth, he passed that on to us and says, this is your inheritance. I'm leaving it for you. Pick it up and journey with it. This isn't something that ends with the death of Christ. This is something that, in fact, continues on as we journey with him, as we go into this space together. It's an invitation to be be part of his plan 
to make the world better. His plan to gather all things to him. See, we cannot focus on the world around us if we're caught up <clears throat> in sin. We'll either be too focused on fulfilling our own wants, too focused on that whole selfish attitude, or we'll be too focused on fighting these impulses. That's the other way we can, it can keep us from the plan. It's going, well, I don't have time to give to this person. I don't have time to help this person. I don't have time to counsel this person because I'm just so messed up. And I've got so much to work on and I feel like something is going to come out that I don't want to say or I'm going to do something I don't want to do because I've got this issue that I need to deal with. And sometimes that can debilitate us in a, in a healthy way to know that we need to take a step back and deal with something. And sometimes it can keep us out of the, out of the fight, as we say, because we feel like we can't do something. <laughs> Well, the question is, <clears throat> whose strength do we fight with? Why is it that we are in this game to begin with? Is it because of anything that we've done? Anything that we could ever possibly do? Or is it, in fact, because of the grace of God, who has called us to be blameless, even when he knew that we weren't going to act blamelessly all of the time? And that is the root and that is the core that we need to remind ourselves of, remind each other of as we journey forward, saying, not to say as an excuse, it's okay, everyone sins, but to remind us, it's okay because of God's grace. And I want to help you and I want to journey with you and our desire definitely should be to um, act more blamelessly each and every day, but not because of anything in herself, because of everything in the grace of Christ. To finish off the verse, in verse 13, it talks about this strength that we've been given and how we have been equipped and how we continue to uh, flourish and manifest that. <clears throat> verse 13 says, In him, you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked <clears throat> with the seal and the promise of the Holy Spirit. And this is the pledge of your inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. So we've received our inheritance, but the mark of our inheritance is the Holy Spirit. How we know that we have received this inheritance, how we know that we have taken hold of this thing that God has given to us as a gift after his death is that we have the Holy Spirit is that we journey with the Holy Spirit. So we take our strength from the Holy Spirit as we journey forward. It's a reminder to us that what God has done once in us to save us, he wishes to continue through us to save the world, to continue to refine us, to continue to refine those people we meet, those people we interact with. See, the Holy Spirit isn't this thing we have in capsule inside of us that is, oh, I know I'm saved because I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a thing that we have or a person that we have, a, whatever way you want to talk about it, in order to use, to call upon. Say, God, I really need your help in this situation. God, I really need you to guide me. I really need you to show me how to speak with this person. I really need you to speak through me because I don't even know what I'm saying. And, and words are coming out and this person heard them. And have you ever had that conversation? Where you said something and you left and you don't even remember. And years later, this person comes back and says, Oh, thank God for what you said. It saved my marriage. It saved whatever. It, it did something to me. And you think, well, I don't even know what I said. It must have been the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you're just forgetful and we don't remember what we say. But this is a way that we can access sort of the Holy Spirit or, or he uses us and we in turn use him and, and, and make the world different than it is today. So to leave us with some questions here, <clears throat> do you ever feel like you're held back by your sin? 
or you've been destined as blameless. You ever wonder what God's plan is in everything? Well, I think there's a lot we can talk about in what his plan is or how we see it, but more importantly, his plan starts with us. As we journey with him, as we grow with him. And I hear this all the time, the world is getting worse, so I can't wait till Jesus comes back. Well, that's a nice thing to say, but the question is, why are we waiting? There's the world. There's lots of bad things in the world, but there's also lots of good things in the world. So why don't instead we celebrate those, and we partner with those, and we journey with those, and we seek to see what God is doing today, and how God is continuing to make the world better, and how he wants to use us to do that. Because, yeah, there is bad things. And it's easy to focus on those and go, well... Satan is the ruler of this world, so of course it's getting worse. But the, the, that doesn't mean that we're no longer in the world. We are here. And we have the Holy Spirit in us who is far greater than the spirits that are in this world. So why wait? The world is getting better every time we personally reject Satan's lies in our lives. And every time we share that truth with other people. And they hear it, and they get it. And that's what we call bringing God's kingdom to the world. Or as we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just as, in heaven, as it as is in heaven. We don't pray that just with our words, but we pray that with our actions. And so as we wake up, we say, God, how, can, how do you want to use me today to bring your kingdom to this world through the people I meet, through the ways I talk with people, through the way I conduct myself, whether it's some personal sin issue I'm dealing with, I want to be better at that, so guide me in that respect so I can bring your kingdom to the people who, who see me, who witness me. Show me how I can manifest this. Show me how you want to work through me and how you want to guide me, how you want to grow me. And so, yes, it's intensely personal, but it's also intensely uh, impersonal, or not impersonal, but it's greater <clears throat> than us as well, and just our individual journey. So that is <coughs> what we're looking at today. Of course, that is not a, this is what sin is, so now you know. Um, it was more of a, we're going to talk about sin and and see where that leads us because again it's not to me it's not extraordinarily useful to define something it's helpful sometimes but what is extraordinarily useful is what we do with that knowledge how we journey with it how it helps us personally and also how it helps those around us how we can actually walk with this knowledge we have